Hi, River of Life. Uh, it's wonderful for me to be up on the stage in the panel this week. As Scott mentioned, he's away, and so I've got the privilege of being the interviewer and also uh, enjoying uh, the interview this week. And I've been so encouraged throughout the series as we've done Reconciled through the different uh, areas we've gone to, through the different stories of pain we've heard. It's, it's such a good thing to do as a church. And I can see it bringing us together across the dividing walls that were there previously. God is at work in our church. And the verse we've been sharing uh, throughout the series is this one from Romans 15. And, and we've been looking at verse 1 quite a bit where it says, We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. This is a verse I never really saw before, but it speaks about those uh, people who are willing to hear and uh, help out and listen to the failings, not necessarily failings, but the pain, the hurt that other peoples have felt that we may not have been aware of. And definitely for me, throughout the series, I've, I've heard stories that have opened my eyes to the different contexts and different pain that people are feeling across our church, and none more than last week. I was amazed at some of the things shared, uh, both uh, in the interview and in the Zoom platform afterwards, about the hurt and the pain of Indebele people. And earlier this week, I was reading further in Romans 15, and in verse 5, it comes to, May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus so that with one heart and mouth you may glorify God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what it's about. That's why Jesus went to the cross, that we, uh, different tribes and tongues and languages, different people, different upbringings, may with one heart and mouth glorify God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he, and he prays that God would give us strength and encouragement. And we continue to look for that in our church as we work through this series. Uh, and so this week, I'm delighted that we're going to be chatting about See My Pain Shona. And we've got some incredible Shona people on the panel this week. And what you can see here is the interviewees of the last 10 weeks have become the interviewers. And Josie Wazara is back with us. You would remember her wonderful husband, Blessing, and their family. She left Blessing at home this week, uh, but she's going to join us to, to share in this time. And Moose and Nazi, hi babes. <laughs> <laughs> Moose and Nazi Maramwidze are here with us. Uh, this is a fantastic couple in our church. You know them well, uh, and they are Shonas as well. And they're going to be sharing some of the pain in their lives and in their upbringing. Uh, so we're not going to waste any more time. I'm going to cut across now to Josie and say, Josie, as a Shona woman, uh, grown up in Zimbabwe, uh, share some of the things. Uh, what has been the pain uh, within your Shona culture? So, not only am I Shona, I am a Shona Karanga. Right? Wow. So we're the real Karanga. deal. <laughs> 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 and um, I think for me, I actually wanted, you know, I want to start from how we grew up uh, as, as Shona children and uh, just talk about the issue of black tax um, that, that's what we've, we've decided to call it. <laughs> and um, just how, when you, when you start out as a family, um, you already start out and there's so much extended family around you in your home. So initially, I mean, you start and there's an aunt and you know, you have all these relatives around you and it's okay, it's comfortable. And then slowly as family loses more family and there are more children to be looked after, you know, I remember for us, it got to a point where at some point we were like 15 people um, in that household. And you can see the quality of your lives changing. Right. Um, so one moment you could afford to have ice cream and then afterwards you can't. But you understand because there is a crisis and there are people who need to be looked after. Um, and then it comes to issues of school fees. and So you can tell your parents are struggling to keep everybody afloat. But the family needs to look after the entire extended family. And you always have relatives who are coming, people who can't even be described like, so how are we related to them? Ah, well, 
they lived next door and then behind that mountain and <laughs> you can't tell what sort of relationship you have and who they are to you and they're always coming and displacing you in the home and it sounds <laughs> petty but it really would kind of disrupt your everyday life and I mean in some families they've actually also been instances where people have actually experienced abuse because of right. you know all of that but you have to care for family because if you don't then there are repercussions to it you know you are, you pay a price uh, people talk about how you all of a sudden think you're special just because you have resources so you keep taking people in and for us I think we struggled with the erosion of your standard of living <laughs> and then before you know it you're grown and then the very people who were supported by your family complained to say they were treated badly and for us I mean and I can't say they were not or they were maybe because that's their reality but from my reality I feel like but we've had to share everything that I mean biblically we were we are the primary family for our parents but they were extended and shared wealth and that's what the culture requires of them but my life has been eroded and I feel like it's been compromised and then the people are not grateful. Wow. Wow. So I think when I heard people said I was hurt for my parents and also hurt for myself because I felt like mm. we were deprived and yet people are not grateful. Wow. Mm. Wow. So black tax. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so I've learned something new already. Yeah. Black tax. Yeah. Great, Josie. Yeah. Nazi, coming across to you, what would your pain be? Was it similar or where would the pain be for you? Thanks, AE. Um, I think I can definitely relate to the black tax, although I didn't know that's what it's called. <laughs> um, I have two things that I would like to share um, in terms of pain that I've experienced. The first is I remember being a young um, child and um, a relative had passed away. And I remember hearing a lot of contention happening um, within the elders in my family. And um, the division seemed to be between those who were saying we are Christian and we are believers mm. and those who were saying this is our culture and this is who we are and this is what we do when someone dies. Mm. And, he, and, and, you know, as a child, you don't quite understand. I, I didn't, you know, I have a, a full grasp of the gospel at the time, but it was um, very difficult. But I distinctly remember it and I distinctly remember saying to myself, so at some point, I'm going to have to make a decision about mm. this because it seems everyone has somewhere where they stand. There are some who are saying we don't do this, some are saying we do it this way, and yeah. some who are saying we can, all of it is inclusive and welcome. Um, so, so I would say for me, part of the pain of being a Shona person is um, how do I celebrate my culture yes. and celebrate being Shona and celebrate all the beauty that comes yes. with my culture, um, but when it opposes or is separate or apart from what the word says, um, how do I tackle that wow. with my family who sees it differently mm. or with uh, my in-laws who might see it differently or with anyone who might see it differently. How do we tackle that? And I've found moments of pain um, um, in those situations. Yeah. Yeah. And then the second would be um, the word mutorwa okay. <laughs> is something that I have mutorwa. battled with as a, a Shona woman. So um, what I did is I looked it up. So I don't know if this is the verified definition, but I thought you would yeah. wonder what Mutorwa means. Yeah. So I looked this up. Josie, I wonder if you would be able to relate to this. This is from Vashona.com, which is a dictionary. <laughs> and it says, Mutorwa means a person belonging to or owning allegiance to a foreign country, one not native in the country or jurisdiction under consideration, or not naturalized there, an alien, a stranger. Mm. And so this, this word mutorwa mm. is what is used to describe a woman who joins a family um, or who becomes married into a family. Right. Mm. And you are um, 
classified mutoro. Oh. So what happens with this is in different contexts um, of our culture, there are places where mutoro is not welcome in certain mm -hmm. discussions or certain places. But I would say the one that um, sort of rings heavily for me is when it comes to the issue of children and where my culture tells me that I am not related to my children. So we would say in Shona, um, as for a woman. So my children are not related to me. They are maramwizes. They identify wow. with their father, but they have no relation to me. And then it plays out in many different forms. So the one I would example I would give that I remember, um, when an aunt of mine passed away, she passed away in a different country and then um, the body was moved to Zim. So there were a number of days between when she had passed and when we eventually got to the point of burying her. Throughout that, I remember it was a very difficult funeral mm. um, because what happens is when a woman dies, her family comes back to make the decisions. So um, because, you, because you are a mutorwa with your in-laws, they don't make the call. Okay. So the, the ones who you are related to are the ones who come in to make the decisions. And so depending on your family as a woman, um, it could be a long drawn out process. There could be things that need to be appeased and a whole lot of things mm -hmm. that happen. So it, generally f funerals can become contentious in such situations. So mm -hmm. this one in particular, we, I knew um, the lady who had passed away was my aunt, that she was pregnant, but not many people knew that. And so um, the, the process was long. We get to the day of the burial. We've done the, the service, the church service, and someone mentions that she was with child. And immediately um, the issue arose that in our culture, you cannot be buried with someone who is not your relative. And so the fetus needed to be removed mm. from my aunt's body. And so everyone was told to leave the room. I mean, you can just imagine you're grieving. It's been hard. And you get to this place and you have to all leave the room. We've done the service. We're about to do body viewing and go to the burial site. And so we left the room. They closed the curtains. They cut her open and removed the fetus mm. from her body. And so for me as a woman, as a, as a Shona woman, that's hard for me to hear because my children who I've carried for nine months mm. are my children. They carry my DNA. They are a part of me. Yes, they are Maramwizes, um, but they are part of me. And um, so things like that mm. hurt as a woman, even hearing that you're an alien or a stranger, you're not fully... Um, a part of the family. So that's wow. the second thing. And so for me, I will just conclude by saying, um, because I've also had issues of rejection, um, just the way that I grew up, when you come, then look forward to being married and having your own family and finally having the picture of what a family looks like. And then you come into a context where you're not quite fully a part of it. Um, is something that a journey that you kind of constantly having to mm. to walk through. Wow, wow. Thanks, we have not called our motoro. <laughs> no, they have not. They have not. So the, the, they they right. call me Murora Makoti, which means daughter-in-law. Okay. But um, I think for me, it's it's still the c culture will play out yeah. Yeah. when culture when the issues there. happen, when decisions are being made about the children, mm -hmm. when you when I die you know, um, when, you know, like one of the things is my mom will often say to me, use these things now because when I die, you have no claim to them because they will go to her brother's children or brother's daughters because they are her relatives and my mother is not my relative. So I'm not actually meant to inherit anything from her. So yes, it goes beyond even just mutorwa, but it's, it's a reality for yeah. us as women mm -hmm. in our culture. Yeah. And, and of course, I'm speaking as a woman and it's an issue for women, but it also affects the men in the family. Yeah. If you're the husband who's lost a wife and all these things are happening mm -hmm. around you. Mm -hmm. So it's, some, it's a cultural issue for women, but it affects all yeah. of us. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Sure. Wow. Josie, did you 
resonate with any of that, or is there anything you have felt on those lines? As well? <laughs> I mean, for me, I think it's, I could relate to a lot of what you're saying, Nati, and the funny thing is, in my husband's family, sometimes they'd make the joke about <laughs> um, and essentially like, and it's, for them it was a joke. I mean, I, it's, it's not like they call me Mutorwa or treat me like one, but it still sort of reinforces something. And as you hear it, re-hear it you realize you are actually an alien or you feel <laughs> like one, yeah. even mm-hmm. though I'm sure, I mean, for them it's, it's a joke, but it's, sort of mm. re-emphasizing mm. that. And to say Ajitongwe is almost to also say you, you have no say really culturally as a, right. as a woman, you know, in, in the family. Mm. But I mean, even just as Nasi has talked about the issue of kids, I'm just thinking about how we have also just been socialized as, as Shona women um, and how a lot of it is aimed towards us serving as wives to our husbands. So even as our mothers would raise us to be like, wake up, how does a wife sleep until this time of day? You know, you have to be cooking. Hey, you are cleaning. Don't clean with your mouth. You know, like your <laughs> husband's... Were, so from when I was a child, I was already just being conditioned to who I should be as a wife. Mm, right. And, um, you know, so as, as you grow up and you're going to all these baby showers and the advice you keep hearing, you have to do this for your husband or else. You, and there's so much of repercussions, and mm-hmm. most of it is always another woman will take him or he'll take another wife. If you fail, if you don't cook for him well and you don't serve him well, if you don't... So you end up sort of operating under fear. Mm-hmm. Because, and I remember for me when I entered my marriage, I entered already competing with a woman I know I mean, I know she doesn't exist. There's no woman, I pray, <laughs> that, <laughs> you know, but already you're, you're already competing with some woman who could do something better than you and my husband could automatically right. just move and have her as his wife. So now when I'm doing things, I'm not doing them only because I love my husband, but I'm doing it because I'm afraid and I need to keep him, mm. you know, mm. and every baby shower, uh, bridal shower you go to, it's reiterated over and over again. Mm. And you know, if anything happened in my marriage or if Blessing did anything, I mean, I'm, I'm grateful I'm Blessing's family saved, at, so you know, I would expect something different. But let's say it did happen, God forbid. The question always within our culture is, what did you not do as the mm. wife? Mm. Okay. So anything that Blessing does reflects back to me and I am the failure and he really has no responsibility for whatever has happened. Um, so we're always having to perform at our optimum. Mm. Mm. And I remember when I started, I even got to the point where I would want to wash Blessing's clothes myself because the wife should wash his clothes, she should iron them, she should feed him, she should... And Blessing is the one who eventually came to me and said, I don't understand why we have a maid and you're washing my clothes. Mm. And I was thinking, but that's what that's a wife what is a supposed to do. And he's like, I don't care who washes my clothes. I just want clean clothes. Right. And for, for that, he liberated me because I could have continued doing it. Mm. And by the end of the day, I would be angry because I'm so tired, right. because I work and I'm doing all these things and I expect him to be grateful and already it starts creating contention between the two of us. Mm. So mm. I feel for me that's part of the burden of just how we have been socialized and it continues to be reiterated even mm-hmm. by, uh, you know, Christian mothers. and. Right you know, they are requiring us to be a certain type of woman. Mm. Okay. Well, thanks. Wow. Well, it's been good to hear from the ladies. <laughs> and uh, now the spotlight turns on to Mus. And Mus, wow. do you want to share a bit about, uh, sure. from the, the man's side as a mm. Shona man, what are some of the things that yeah. cause pain? Thanks, A.E. Um, feels different when you've changed roles. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's amazing. I, I, I do agree with most of the stuff that the ladies have shared. I mean, the Motoro, I think we've had it. I mean, a lot of guys know that. But I think for me, my experience really was um, uh, two experiences, but they play out to be maybe a two-in-one two kind of thing, situation. So initially, uh, I remember very clearly, we, uh, my grandmother had passed away at 96 years old. And by the way, we are the Roji. 
you say you are karanga, then when you with rose. So yeah, so I, I think my grandmother passed away at 96 years old. We were meant to be celebrating a life well lived. And I saw right in the midst of uh, a funeral and a celebration where my fathers, and I remember I was part of that uh, process, they, they couldn't act as much as they wanted to, to bury their mom and really just give him a good send off because they had to wait for my grandmother's side of the family, uh, the Sekuru's uh, uncles in this case, because they were going to be speaking uh, or they had to give direction in terms of how uh, things should proceed right. because my grandmother is viewed as a motorwa or it's not one of you, it's us who have to say things. Okay. Now we are your mothers. And we had to go through an, a process where we had to wait uh, for someone who wasn't there, an uncle who was then going to come later, and there were certain decisions that were made to say, let's carry on, let's, let's honor our, our, our mother. But then when he then eventually came, he undid everything that was planned say, look, you can't do this because uh, I, I wasn't there. You have to listen yes. to what we say. So my, my fathers literally were, were waiting to be given orders or direction. And this is their own mother. And it delayed the, an entire process uh, where we're supposed to be celebrating, honoring a, a life well lived. And I remember instead of us doing that, everything then became politicized. So that is the pain that you see, that they, here is someone who has lived to 96 years old, seen many generations, and we're supposed to be honoring her, celebrating her life, but somebody comes and they say certain things or they give orders. So that's just that pain, that experience, it then dilutes that whole uh, memory that you had about. So I, I remember wow. seeing this and my uncles and, and, and my, my dad's side of the family where we we're very angry about it, and you see tension and everything mm. becomes politicized. Uh, the second story is a flip side, where now my fathers have their sister who passes away, yeah. and now it's, it's their roles have yeah. changed, so now my fathers have become the Sekurus. And now my, my aunts, uh, kids, are coming to my fathers, and they're saying, you need to help us, give us direction. And they can do anything again, because it's their mom, they have to honor and bury them, but now we, we are the ones in control, sort of, and they have to consult us. And so that whole entire process, even to when it comes to uh, when we do give away some of the things that were of the deceased, so they have to ask my uncles, my dad's side, say, should we do this? And you can see an entire family that is waiting literally on... Uh, uh, these are the guys, and this is their mother. They, they can choose to bury their mother the way they want, but because of that cultural connotation, you then have to wait. Otherwise, they, they, there's fear that if you don't do it right, you will uh, get bad luck, things will, will... So it's that fear that comes, mm. you, it's enshrouded in fear, and you can't celebrate your, 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 your deceased or, 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 or just be there with everyone because you then have to play to certain orders and things yeah. like that. So those are things that I can clearly remember that I saw happening in my time. And I mean, there's so many good stuff that we see from a uh, Shona cultural point of view, but mm. that weight, because you're told if you don't do it right, you're gonna get Munyama, which is bad luck. Mm. There's fear, there's all these kind of things. And I would right. say that is the pain that I have experienced uh, being Shona. It yeah. comes with this heaviness, this weight, and shrouded in fear, you can't move, you can't do anything, you have to wait for someone who has to come later. And I know probably some of these guys have also experienced mm. yeah. some of these things. Yeah. Yeah. And that will be the experience that yeah. I have had as right. being Shona. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so there's, there's quite a bit of hurt or tension that comes uh, within uh, when somebody dies. Right. Uh, and also within in-laws and marriage. And exactly. that kind of thing, being raised as a child or extended family. Absolutely, uh, yeah. absolutely. So, so I want to uh, ask you guys now, how, how have you worked through this as a believer, as somebody who, who trusts in the Lord Jesus? Mm. Ultimately, what is, what is the path to peace? Or how, how do we work through these things within the Shona culture? Mm. Nazi, I'm going to start with you, mm -hmm. that's all right. That's, that's fine, A.E. Um, so my two were on culture versus being a Christian, yeah. and then the second one on being a Mutoro. Okay. So I remember when there was a time I was asking God, and I was saying, um, how much of my culture do I throw out? 
Right. What do I keep? What yeah. do I? Because in as much as we can share these stories, it's not to say that our culture is bad or it's exactly. not. To, I think in all things, the enemy can come in and turn things in to go his way, which is bad in any situation. Right. So just for us to make that very clear, we're not yeah. here to right. speak badly about our culture. But the question has to be asked, what do I hold on to and what do I let yes. go of? And I remember for us, um, we, were, we did our pre-marriage counseling mm. with the Gutsies and we were privileged wow. to speak about a certain um, cultural practices that are completely opposing to God's word. And, um, and we, were, we knew what we were not going to participate in and what we would. And mm. we, were, we were very clear, but um, with mm. love and with respect That's and right. with um, the conversations were very different for us than they were you know, as I recall what I saw as a child. Yeah. So I think in all things, even as we tackle these things, we need to remember, I think God reminded me of the fruit of the Spirit. Even mm. when you have discussions, is are you coming cr across with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, yes. faithfulness, self-control? Are right. are th is that what you're exhibiting when you're talking about culture versus... Um, um, Christianity. And then the other thing was when it comes to, because my other question has been on um, totem and identity in that area. Yeah. And God just led me to read from Genesis 1 mm. um, verse, I'll just read from verse 26, which says, sorry, no, I'll back up a little bit. I'll read from verse um, 25. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds and the livestock according to their kinds and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Mm -hmm. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the heaven and over the livestock and all the earth and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Mm. So I felt God answered to me that who I identify as is in him. Yes. He created me in his image. Mm. And I have dominion over the animals and the fish of the sea. So however culture plays out for me, that's first and foremost. Right. So I will not be worshipping any animal or revering an animal. I will be worshipping God. I will not be identifying with the traits of animals. I will be identifying with wow. God. Mm. And then I celebrate my culture. Amazing. And I enjoy being Shona. And I enjoy all the things that yes. come with it. But when anything is contrary to what the word says, I have no issue with saying no. Right. Um, and I feel that's what God has led me in. And then on the Mutorwa issue, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I think this is an ongoing one. Okay. Um, like I said, there's issues of rejection that I've had to deal with, mm. continue to deal with. Um, and I feel God just keeps reassuring me of who I am in him. Um, when he says there's no slave, no free Jew, Greek, there's, right. we are all male, female, we are all equal, we are all one, we are all loved by him. Mm. He adopts us into his family. Yes. He doesn't call us Vatorwa, he calls us his own. Yes. We are co heirs yeah. with Christ, we are seated with him in heavenly places. So I take that truth and I hold on to Amazing. it. And then I have open discussions with my husband when mm. it's hard yeah. and right. I mean we had one yesterday I think you know I, I cried quite a bit <laughs> mm. but he's amazing in um, in just being able to have have open discussions and understand one another and understand our differences and how we were raised and how we can come together even as we raise our own children right. so that I find Fantastic. also brings a lot of peace for me to have that open um, mm. relationship with my husband and not to keep things internalized and make assumptions about being a mutorwa and what that must mean when they act in this way. Um, you know, so I found peace through Christ and who he says I am mm. and in relating to my husband and then in all, even how I relate um, to people around me must just reflect who God well has done. created me to Brilliant. be. Wow, that's mm. fantastic. Well done, Nancy. Yes. Mm. So good, so good. Absolutely. Most, yeah. do you want to chip in on that? Yeah, yeah. Or, or um, any other path to peace you found? Sure. Um, I think, 
for me, um, just having seen these experiences, and they are ongoing, um, but I remember very clearly, um, I think it's Jesus in the book of John, chapter 8 and 32, he says, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Mm. I mean, all the other experiences we've had, it's sort of, we, they, they try and bring, like I said, a weight uh, on you, like a heaviness, and, but all we are seeking for is freedom, freedom to express who we are. And I can borrow and agree with what Nathia said. So I think knowing the truth in a situation, uh, like in these two uh, experiences that I had, and then speaking, standing for the truth in an honoring, res respectful way, I think that has been very helpful for me as well to say, what is, what is Scripture saying in matters regarding uh, our relationship with our, with our, with our parents? Um, she is my mother, I'm, I'm her child, and, and there is that, and nothing can take away from that. Our identity is in Christ. Knowing that truth would then help us to set us free from some of uh, human philosophies or pseudo doctrines, because everyone will always have something to say. Mm -hmm. But I think really finding peace in what God says we are through his son christ jesus mm -hmm. and and really just expressing that even in a context where it's a family broader extended family yeah. and everyone are cheap, have, have opinions or have ideas when you stand with the truth i think you find peace in the sense that you don't deviate okay. um you remain uh, uh, stuck on it mm -hmm. and people know that when it comes to certain, certain issues he will not compromise mm -hmm. because he stands on the truth and we've mm -hmm. we've had to do that i mean even early in our marriage we've had to say no look here we love you guys but this is not consistent with what we believe in mm -hmm. and in a respect respectful and honoring way mm -hmm. and they'll just say i'll leave him this one here he loves church too much and then when when people grow to know that you know what when it comes to issues that are in, that have inconsistent inconsistencies with the word or what we believe in they will just leave you but we speak our mind and we stand on the truth uh, and that has brought us peace first mm -hmm. and then also how we could relate with the rest of the family and even embracing who we are as a Shona people. Mm -hmm. I found that to be very helpful as well, wow. knowing the truth and it is only the truth that will set us yeah. free mm -hmm. and give us that freedom. That's brilliant. Yeah. Yes. Well done. Yeah. So I think it is about knowing your identity, yes. who you are in Christ, knowing the truth of the, the word truth. and what falls in line and what doesn't. What doesn't. Yes. And exactly. then a unity together within Absolutely. the marriage where you support one another and stand for one another. I think those are, those are key things. Absolutely. Well done, guys. Yeah. Rosie, coming to you to, to give us your final thoughts and your journey or your path to peace. Um, maybe I'll start with the, the aspect of being, a sh uh, you know, how we're socialized to be Shona wise yeah, good. and just the whole fear that comes with it. And I think for me, I've, I've had to reconcile the fact that God has not given us a spirit of fear, mm. but of uh, power of love, of a sound mind. That's yeah. good. And the most I can do is love blessing um, for who he is and serve him out of love, yes. you know, without necessarily, without having to compete um, with this woman who has been created um, mm. You know, in my image, from what I have been told, that if, if you fail, somebody is going to come and, and, mm. and you know, take your place. Um, and in that, you, you get a sense of freedom because, I mean, you know, there are women who've taken other people's husbands. Mm. And you've heard, the, and it's been justified because she did not cook well for him. She did not. Mm. But it's not her fault. He has made the choice to do it. Right. You know, so I only have control in as much as what I can do and how I will serve my husband as a wife. That's right. Whatever choices he does and makes out of that are his own. I mean, I remember at um, my friend's bridal shower, the lady even said, you have to always mend his buttons and pack a lunchbox for him. <laughs> you know, like something specific, like she knows this man. If you don't, his secretary will fix who stitch the buttons <laughs> and then she'll give him food and then he'll have an affair with her, you know. So you leave that and it's, it's just all fear induced yeah. right. um, as you walk into the marriage. So just to always for me remember that I have to operate from a place of love and whatever decisions or whatever he ever does out of that is his decision and his choice and I have no control over it but I have control over me. Mm. Um, 
And when it pertains to black tax, that's like a complex <laughs> one. Because, you know, when you think about it, it's um, a, a lot of us as black families come from disadvantaged backgrounds. And we need to be helping and supporting and, you know, helping each other. And yet, so to what extent can you balance not compromising right. the integrity and the well-being of the core household, um, you know, to benefit, um, you know, the rest of, of the clan and the family? And it's, it's a tricky one. And I think for us, at least, we haven't really been confronted with that a lot. But I've seen for some families just how it's always about discussing how to do it, how do we support the family, and agreeing on it, and then standing as a unit and as a couple, right. you know, to know how to deal with that. And sometimes I feel like um, maybe my father could have given my mother a little more support, um, you know, especially when it's um, my father's side of the family, and she's having to deal with things that happen, like you wake up one morning and mm. there's just an empty ice cream container in the fridge and no one knows who has eaten it and she wants to shout at everybody but then you also have members of your husband's family hmm. and you don't know what that will mean and what that will right. say to what extent can then the husband come up and say look you know i'm not happy you guys have done this and she's not the one having to deal with it yeah. okay. and you know just agreeing how do we help our parents how do we support them and agreeing as a family unit and yet also ensuring that you don't erode or compromise the integrity of the household. Yeah. So I uh, think, yeah. I don't yeah. know, I, I'm not <laughs> able to reconcile, I don't know how to even work around it. And at least I'm grateful I haven't been confronted with it, but I know there are a lot of people yeah. struggling sure. with staying with in-laws in the mm. home and how to deal with supporting mm. family. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And I think what you say about uh, family discussions or, or coming together and discussing how are we going to do this as a family, mm where there's a unity. I think mm. it's, I mean, even within my own family, there's mm. been times where we've had to sit around the table and say, this is, the, this is the situation we're in as a family. How are we going to deal with this? And my brother would say, I can do this. My sister would say, we can do this. And then you come out of there feeling, okay, we're in this together. Yeah. And it works, sure. so I think, what you said there. And I love the bit about not living in fear. Yeah. Um, but, but love conquers. Love yeah, absolutely. Conquers. Yeah, so that's, that's been fantastic. Mm. Guys, mm. thank you so much for sharing. Uh, I know it's not easy to come and, and, and talk about these things and we really appreciate uh, what you guys have shared uh, because I know there's many people watching who will be resonating and saying, yeah, that's, that's exactly where we're at mm. and we trust that, that through God and his strength we'll be able to, to move forward to, to reconciliation even in these areas. Mm. And one thing I've picked up today is the importance of kingdom culture mm. over uh, earthly culture or our cultures. Mm and mm -hmm. our cultures are good there's so many good aspects about shona culture and the culture even white culture we've got some good things mm -hmm. uh, but the important thing is to know that we are now kingdom culture we are now people who look to christ and his word mm -hmm. we look to to christ for our identity uh, we look to be unified in the church to assist one another and that trumps our cultures mm -hmm. and that that's the exciting thing that we get to do as believers i'm a first generation believer in my family mm. uh, and I get now to set a new culture for my children and the children after them um, embracing what is good about my culture and teaching the kids that we don't do this anymore because this is what God says and so we get to start a new culture within our families and Absolutely. I think that's something that you guys are definitely doing Thank so you. well done I just Thanks would love you. to lead you in communion mm. and uh, I love Jesus' uh, sorry, Paul's words as he comes to communion. He says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And similarly, he took the cup. This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And this new covenant brings us into a whole new uh, world right, within, right. within Christ and remembering his death uh, helps us in these, in these discussions and, and in what we've spoken about today. So I'm just going to break bread uh, and wine and, and lead you guys through it. Lord Jesus, we thank you this morning for your body broken for us. Mm. And we thank you for what we've discussed this morning 
And we thank you for the cross and for your death on the cross, which gives us a new uh, life. It gives us new beliefs, gives us new truth, new identity, uh, even a new culture, Lord Jesus. And so we break this bread thanking you for the cross. Josie, the body of Jesus broken for you. And the blood of Jesus shed for you. Nazi, the body of Jesus broken for you. And the blood of Jesus shed for you. Moose, the body of Jesus broken for you. And the blood of Jesus shed for you. Let's take the bread together. Father, thank you for Jesus' death on the cross for thank us. You. We take this bread and remember your death, Lord Jesus. Mm -hmm. Jesus, we thank you afresh this morning as we remember your blood shed for us, shed for everyone in the earth, shed for every culture and tribe and language. We thank you for the newness that brings as we put our faith in you. We take your blood this morning together. I'd just love to pray for you guys as we close. Sure. Father God, we thank you this morning for what mm. you've done. Thank, thank you me. that we've been able to come together and share these stories, share these areas of pain and hurt in our upbringing, in our families, within marriage and extended family even in weddings and funerals and those times within Shona culture, we ask, Lord Jesus, that you would help us uh, across the church, uh, Shona people, that we would begin to see uh, your kingdom coming and your, uh, your truth coming into all these different situations, Lord. Thank you for uh, Musa Nazi and for their marriage and their family. Thank you for Blessing and Josie, for these That's two right. strong families in our church, and we pray your blessing on them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us, everyone. And we're going to be going across to the Zoom call now uh, after some worship. God bless you guys this week. And we'll see you next week uh, for See My Pain Unborn. Mm. Thank you, guys. Thank you.